You just want to try to be good enough at this level. Yeah. To try and given a few more opportunities, and, and once that's achieved, you set yourself new goals and new targets, and you want to start achieving new things. Yeah. Now I look back at my career, and I, I didn't start off as well as I wanted, and you know, it's taught me that uh, you know when you go through good periods, don't give it away, and you know, try and cash in when you can. Because uh, you never know when that, that bad bird's coming, so you know, it taught me a good lesson. Jack was the best all-rounder. Um, amazing character, amazing player. Probably one of the top five players to ever play. Yeah! Statistically, he's the greatest cricketer that's ever walked the planet. For me, Jacques is, is certainly the best all-rounder that I've ever come across, whether it's playing against or playing with. The volume of runs that he's scored and the wickets that he's taken and the workload that's been put on him, well, in my era, I've never seen a better cricketer than him. He batted and bowled, so that makes him a, a really true champion. I think someone uh, with his figures with bat and ball, it's, it's quite amazing. Look at Jack Cullis' record, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's mind-blowing, really. Numero Uno, he was, uh, as a batter, he was fantastic. You know, his concentration, his dedication, and his application, and the way he went about his batting was, was absolutely phenomenal. He's just so disciplined and just... Yeah, beats you into a pulp over a long, long period of time and his bat sometimes looks about this wide and you just think, I don't know how we're going to get this guy out. He's going to go down in, in the history of, of cricketers and a lot of people have said it, probably the greatest player that's played the game. Born in Cape Town in 1975, Jacques Henry Callis was raised on South Africa's Western Cape. His school days were marked by academic and sporting prowess and a single-mindedness which would ultimately lead to a stellar career. Well, my first memory of him was going to watch him play at junior school and he wore a helmet. Now in those days, and we're talking 1987, 1988, uh, schoolboys did not wear helmets and little boys definitely did not wear helmets. And he got uh, a little bit ribbed and ripped off for that and nothing mattered to him. And it, it was an interesting message that he sent then, because right from early days he showed that if he is determined to stick to something, he would stick to it. And he wanted a helmet, it would help his batting, and uh, he stuck to it. He wasn't someone who suffered from peer pressure, you know, and that's people who really allow what other people say to affect them. Jacques was always just a keen bean. Um, <laughs> innocent keen bean just wanting to play sport, just wanting to play the, a ball, a tennis ball, cricket ball, whatever it was. and and have a little bit of competition. You would always hear of him and he was doing very well in cricket, but he was also very good at rugby and academically he was also very good. I was always intrigued as to what his recipe was for his success. Um, and it was, it was ultimately the fact that he was just driven and really wanted to do well. I, mean, I remember playing cricket here at the school and, and seeing this, this little guy who I didn't even know his name in the nets and he would
his dad would be throwing to him when we would start batting. I got to meet this guy in the nets and uh, saw him batting and he was pretty much textbook then with his technique. And before long people would come and join him at the nets and someone would say to him, uh, can I bowl at you? And he'd say, yes please. We'd finish our innings and then the opposition would, would go into bat and we'd walk off the field ready to go home and that little figure was still there in the nets, just hitting balls, hitting balls, hitting balls. And he had spent two to three hours playing in the nets, regardless of the comments he took from other boys. We always wondered who this kid was. Well, <laughs> now we know. The fact that he was so driven to do well and was so prepared to put in the extra hours when everybody was at home and when it was raining, um, I mean, he must, have, he must have worn so many bowling machines out. You get kids at school who are highly talented who don't have to work that hard because of their talent and you get other kids who don't quite have the talent and they've really got to work hard to try and just keep up with the talented guys. And here you've got Jacques Cullis who's both. He's unbelievably talented, but working harder than any other kid at school, talented or not. As a young man, he grew up without a mother. His mother died when, when he was very young. And that brought the family very, very close together. And so his father brought Jacques up uh, and was a huge support for him. And one cannot underestimate the extent of Jacques' father and the role that he played in his life. Everybody plays for a reason, whether that's your child or a friend or a family, um, or just your passion for the game. There, there's, there's always got to be a driving factor, and I, and I definitely think in Jacques' life, um, his father was a huge factor. He backed him, he supported him, he bowled innumerable balls at him on Sundays. His father was a huge inspiration to him and, uh, and again, a parent can often push you so hard that it pushes you over the edge, whereas Jacques had a particularly good understanding with his father. I think it's important in uh, young sportsmen's lives that they get taught early to overcome adversity. And they need adversity, they need to be dropped from sides, they need for things not to go their way. And then they've got to be mentored by their coaches, by their parents, by teachers on how to overcome that adversity. And the sooner they can learn that, the better. Now Jacques got left out of a provincial under 15 side uh, totally unexpectedly. It was kind of like, well, why is Jacques not there? And he said to me at the time, just watch me, I'm going to show them. And then, all fairness, he's been showing the world ever since then. On leaving Weinberg, Callis joined local club Claremont before graduating to first class cricket with Western Province as an 18 year old. His South Africa debut followed in 1995, but his international career began slowly. I mean, Jacques, for nine innings, he was averaging about 10, I think, and suddenly everyone just, just knew that he has a kid who's got great ability. Give him some time at the crease or give him some time in the game, and he will show what he's worth. At that stage, I was under pressure to, to keep my place in the side. It was the fifth day, it was against Shane Warne at the MCG to save a test match. And that was a pretty big test of character. And we were facing Warney on, on the last day on the turning wicket and managed to get 100 and above all, you know, helped save the game. That 100, that's what really made him believe that he did belong um, and that he had the ability to play at the highest level. Oh, he's played that one pretty well. <laughs> Lent back and uh, managed to get it away down to square leg. Shane Warne later did admit that it was one of the best hundreds that he'd seen from a young batsman. Nice, well, well played. But those are definitely more important than the ones where uh, you don't get the result for your team, so that one would have to stand out. Callis surely is going to go back. Well played. A deserved hundred. Yes, he should be happy. He's put a lot of effort into that. When he came into the team, South Africa didn't have a batsman averaging in the 40s. They were playing against Australia, whose whole top six averaged 50. And much as he may not have had an obsession with statistics and averages, the rest of us in the media did. And we all wrote, how can you compare this top order with that top order? He was such an important cog in that South African side for such a long time. He played in a team for a long time with a very vulnerable middle order. And he was either going in, uh, if he went in at 10 for two, or whatever it may be, 
he had to repair the innings. He was told and was began to believe that he had to get his average into the 40s and then push it on, carry on and get that average into the 50s. And it's true, it does. Uh, when the scoreboard shows your statistics when you walk out to bat and there you are averaging 50, it, it does have an effect on the bowlers and the fielding side. It just does. He did change the course of games by, you know, hammering the opposition into submission, but over a long period of time. And in a lot of ways, he may be helped a lot of the other players down the list as well. Jack always felt that it was almost his job to make sure that the team got to, to 400, which is always a sort of benchmark in test cricket. Players coming in after him would find the, the going a lot easier, uh, particularly in South Africa, because they're coming in against an older ball where the bowlers are a bit tighter, whereas Callis has done a lot of the hard work when the ball's new and seeming around all over the place. He's done a lot of that hard graft early um, to help the other guys in the team. He's just so disciplined and just, yeah, beats you into a pulp over a long, long period of time. And, and you just think, I don't know how we're going to get this guy out. <laughs> Callis had become a fixture in South Africa's top order. And in the 1998 series in England, he showcased another side to his game. The greatest recollection is that it was Jacques Callis, the bowler, who arrived. He was an explosive bowler. You know, he, when he came on, uh, he had pace, uh, he swung it a bit, and he was a wicket taker, big time wicket taker. He bowled a heavy ball, a uh, good bouncer, and, and I think he was just so consistent and so disciplined all the time. He was just, you know, you knew what you were going to get, it was going to be there or thereabouts. There's never, hardly ever a loose ball. And look, he's got nearly 300 test wickets, so you can't really knock that. A man of the match performance at Old Trafford proved his worth to South Africa's test team, and Callis proved equally decisive in the one-day format. Against Sri Lanka in the semi-final of the ICC knockout trophy, he once again demonstrated his talent with a bat, scoring an unbeaten 113. And the final against the West Indies saw the bowling of Callis come to the fore. He took five wickets in the final um, against the West Indies and um, was man of the match. Uh, so whilst all the frontline bowlers were struggling and scratching their heads and thinking, how do we bowl on this? Callis just thought, well, take the pitch out of the equation. Bowl full and let it swing through the air. He's whacked that one away to square leg for four. South Africa have won the World's International Cup in great style. Callis was named player of the tournament as South Africa became the first winners of the competition. He returned from Bangladesh with his reputation further enhanced, and in the ensuing years, he confirmed his status as one of the world's top players. Global recognition truly arrived in 2005, when he collected the ICC Cricketer of the Year Award, an honor he shared with England's Andrew Flintoff. And by now, his performances had reignited an age-old debate. We would travel around on the team bus going from hotel to hotel or ground to ground. And this was the biggest argument we used to have in our dressing, in, in our team bus. Was Jacques Callis the best player to ever play the game? And it was like, whoa, this is a pretty big, uh, pretty big point. And, and I reckon more than half the team said, yes, he's the best player to ever play the game. I didn't think I'd ever see anybody that you could even remotely compare to Gary Sobers as an all-round cricketer. This is figures and the, the quality of his play and the way he's gone about it has just been enormous for South Africa. I mean, they used to talk about him being in his bubble and that sort of thing, which when he batted, he very much was. But he, he was, he had a wonderful cricket mind, a cricket brain. As a cricketer, he wasn't one of those who, who set the world on fire like a Brian Lara who could tear bowlers apart and really hurt an opposition. Jacques would be more like a clinician and you would just surgically slowly but surely remove the heart out of the opposition as opposed to tear it out of them. He's quietly spoken, he's quite an introverted guy which by virtue of that means he's, he's a really deep thinker, he's, he's thinking all the time about his game, about how to get better. He was security but it was also the way that he treated and accepted success and 
failure. Never too up, never too down. Players who were likely to, to beat themselves up and get too down on themselves would almost feel guilty because if the great man had, had also made naught and he was quietly preparing for the next innings and accepting that as part of the game, then why should they get too upset? He's got this natural wiring about really being inside his own head, processing things for himself. So he's able to operate inside this bubble and it doesn't matter what other people say and what other people do, he knows what he needs to do and he's processing his processes in this space. He had five coaches in the national team who said to him, Jacques, you're my rock. You're the one we're going to build this innings around. You can't get out. None of them said, I tell you what, Jacques, just go out there and express yourself. See how quickly you can score. He didn't have a, what you would call a signature stroke, but Callis was so good all round that you didn't, you didn't really sort of pigeonhole any specific shot that he played. Jacques could absorb pressure, absorb, absorb pressure, but just facing ball after ball, because his technique was so good. Being the team man he was, uh, he followed instructions and he followed orders. And, and that's why, uh, I mean, there, there were times later on in his career, um, three of his fastest hundreds came in the last two years of his career. So it shows what he always had, but he played within himself for the team as a batsman. He sort of got quite a fright when he got out. If he, especially if he got out early, you, you'd go, wow, you know, and it, it spoiled your day. You didn't have shots that he played to describe. People who say, yes, Callis was very good and he was a great accumulator and, uh, and he was very reliable and he was a rock of the innings, but he, he, there wasn't that spark of genius. Although, yes, uh, there, there was, there was. And he either needed to be given the freedom and the license to display it, or he needed to be in a situation of, of a crisis. One such occasion, in 2011, was a test match in Cape Town against India. The reverse sweep's been around for a long, long time. There's a perception that it's a modern shot. Callis was aware of it as a schoolboy and saw it as a schoolboy and decided, after thinking and analysing uh, the merits and the risks of the reverse sweep, that he didn't need it in his repertoire. So he never practised it, he never played it, and he wasn't interested. And then at Newlands, in the, in the uh, test match against uh, India, Harbhajan Singh was uh, turning it square and getting the ball to bounce as well. Yeah, yeah. He's bowled him. He has bowled him. The ball going off the pads and going back and hitting the stumps. So Harbhajan Singh on fire. Two wickets in two overs. First Peterson and now the dangerous Amla. South Africa were in trouble and required an injured callus to turn the tide. Callis knew he was under pressure and came to the conclusion that even with his great skill and patience and temperament, he, he would be dismissed unless he could somehow change the way Harbhajan had set the game up for India. So he played the reverse sweep. Not once, not twice, but ten times. He hit four boundaries, reverse sweeping Harbhajan out of the rough. The field was changed, the pressure was released, he scored his second century of the test match and saved the series for South Africa. That was genius. A throw, Jacques Callis, South Africa's superstar, absolutely no doubt about that, he's got two centuries in one match. By 2013, the reverse sweep was in regular use and to good effect. His shot-making ability and patience saw Callis become only the fourth batsman to score 13,000 test runs. Well, you know, if someone had said when I started my career I'd get 13,000 test runs, I probably would have laughed at them. Um, you know, you play back, backyard cricket when you're a youngster and you, you dream of, of doing stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it, it means a, an awful amount to me and um, you know, obviously very proud of the achievement. Callis ended a momentous 2013 with his final Proteus appearance in Durban. And unsurprisingly, he delivered another century. It was a tremendous um, innings. Uh, he, he, it was very typical Callis in the sense that he played within himself, as he had done for 20 years.
he limited himself to the shots that were, were worth the, the risk or that were low risk in difficult conditions. Played very, very much for the team. And was modest in his acknowledgement of the of the applause when he reached his hundred. But you know, it, what a special moment! Uh, there's no doubt he was a pillar in the in the Proteus team. Uh, he was a phenomenal player. Uh, his records speak for himself. He's the only player who scored 11,000 plus runs in both Test and ODI cricket, so he leaves a big void. It's going to be hard for them to, to fill those boots. Well, they can't fill those boots. They've got to, they've got to find somebody to half fill those boots. It is an area that hopefully, you know, we, you know, kids will now, you know, really inspire to want to be a Jacques killer. This is hard work to be able to bowl and bat and catch, you know, so it, it requires a really special human being. I think his achievements always stand out to youngsters that wanting to maybe even better his achievements or see that it's, it's possible. One achievement in particular stood out. In 2010, Callis had scored his first double century. When he overcame that big barrier of the 200, which he had gone most of his career and, and it had eluded him. And I made uh, a reference to it when we opened the cricket ground, the Jacques Callis Oval, and I said to him, Jacques, when you get your 200, uh, there's going to be a bench here for you, especially marking the occasion. And when he got his 200, I got a little SMS saying, my bench, question mark. <laughs> well, I think you can see in hindsight how he's come back and put into the school. Um, always having a relationship with his teachers and his coaches. He has a scholarship in his name at the school. He has a field named after him. And the fact that he's here fairly often, or as often as he can be, is an inspiration to the other boys. And a full credit to him that he's prepared to put back something to an institution uh, which gave him his foundation. I'm actually very nervous today. Um, I'm doing something for the first time I haven't done in, in 12 years. And it's not about speaking here today, it's actually about playing a game of rugby this afternoon against the school side. He's a very humble uh, gentleman and in that in itself, just who he is and what he's achieved, he can he can be an inspiration to youngsters. Well, I think he's a very modest guy. Um, he's a real patriot for Weinberg. Uh, brings the score up. He's a shark. I love him. <laughs> and that's why I came to Weinberg from Namibia. Hey, Wombo, to come see Jacques Callis. He's a man. Weinberg's favorite son, Jacques Callis. Neither are both a mess cavalier, nor a figurehead such as Imran Khan, but the numbers tell their own story. Close to 600 test and one-day wickets, more than 300 catches, and nearly 25,000 runs. The greatest ever all-rounder. Oh, yes, John Callis, your little beauty. That's 50 and the fastest in test cricket. Well done. As you're playing the game, I don't think stats mean, mean that much to the players. Um, you know, you, you play long enough, you get those stats, so you tend to just go with, with all the records and that without even worrying too much about them. Of course, you've got to add a couple of hundred test match catches to all the records that you set up with a bat and the ball. The way he had gone all these years and the amount of runs he has scored consistently, the, the contribution he has done with the ball and the contribution he has done uh, fielding-wise as well. So when you take that entire package, I think any side would want to have that kind of a quality player in your rank. Someone uh, with his figures with bat and ball, it's, it's quite amazing. I'd, I'd be happy to have as many wickets as him just as a bowler. So for him to, yeah, obviously get that many wickets, make that many runs, um, it shows that uh, that's a true champion. He's just a, a delightful bloke who um, had a wonderful talent, who's appreciative of all those that have assisted him throughout his career. 
and is a good friend. There's no skeletons in the cupboard or anything like that, just gets on with what he has to do. Super bloke, super player. I was very privileged to have watched so much of it. His greatness won't really be uh, fully appreciated and realised until some way down the line. Um, I mean, a, a decade or more after he's gone, then perhaps people will begin to realise. Chuck's done tremendously well for his country and, and contributed a lot for world cricket. And uh, hats off to him, um, the fantastic career he had. He was pragmatic and he was philosophical about the game. And it was that influence uh, that had as much effect on his teammates for almost two decades than his runs, his wickets and his catches. Because he had that calm, reassuring presence about him that if he was in the corner of the change room, quietly going about his business, preparing to bowl or to bat, then everything would be okay. Legacy to the school and to the country, to the world, uh, it's the same. It's uh, someone who's totally committed, gave his level best, modest, humble, uh, and that you don't have to seek out headlines, which he doesn't do. Better for the team, he's better for his school, better for his country, and we can all be very, very proud of him.